Good day, guys. I was uh, thinking, if you want to experiment with uh, these pulse induction detectors, uh, you know, doing up the receivers, uh, just um, having a listen, small test targets, optimizing the design, and you, you really don't want to be sitting at your workbench with a dirty big coil on the thing. Um, there's uh, too much interaction, and if you want to have the correct uh, receive coil, you, know, you could disconnect the um, input front end and you know put some sort of load on it. But the way these detectors work, you really want um, anything happening on the transmit coming in uh, with with the uh, receive timings, and you know just in case anything goes skew if you wouldn't uh, realize it. But I'm going to show you a little quick trick. I just made, I've got some scrappy parts here and you can make this yourself. I'll just get over here. This is what I used. I just used this. This is um, tin plated copper wire. Now, I make a, a point of saying it's tin plated. You must use tin plated because the tin offers a little bit of resistance strand to strand so when you um, um, energize the coil which you make out of this stuff it uh, burns off the eddy currents in the receive cycle you don't want this acting as one big piece of um, you know, large diameter solid metal because it'll desensitize the uh, receiver the decay time will go into the receiver and it won't pick up anything. You must either use Litz wire. I don't want to use Litz wire because the stuff's expensive, but you can get away with tin plated copper. Uh, very small stranded stuff like that. And um, what's it? It's only got a part number. Oh no, here we go. It's down here. Um, it's seven strands of 0 0.2 millimeters. And it's made in China, of course. And uh, it's got a CE approval on it and whatever. Okay, it's it's very very horrible type, just hook up wire, very thin. It wouldn't even handle much current. But what I did now, I had these cores here. These are fairly big ferrite. We call these pot cores, believe it or not. I suppose it's like a pot, sort of, and. I've had these around for a while. I was actually building up some very low frequency preamplifiers for people who did, uh, I wanted to listen to whales. I'm not joking, okay? This is a while ago, but I had a few of these left over. And these um, have a initial permeability of 9,500. That is really high. It doesn't have to be that high, but I'll explain that you can get away with anything between 1800 or so, even 1500. The higher the, um, the permeability of this ferrite material means you have to do less turns of wire. And, you know, if, if it's uh, very like, if it was in, if it was in, say the permeability was one, which is air, you'd have to do, um, God, you'd be doing hundreds and hundreds of turns of wire. With this, you don't have to. This steps up um, how, how um, it, it basically is taking place of air. It's enclosing the fields as well, the uh, electromagnetic fields in the structure. And on this one, I've got it set up on my meter there. I'll just uh, do that. This is a LCR meter. And L for inductance, C for capacitance, R for resistance. And just this uh, 20, 26, 27 turns on this core. And I've that, um, that uh, cloth tape I found the other day uh, works beautifully to hold windings in. It's actually the right size. So no complaints there. So I've just wound it. You don't have to be neat. You can do a jumble wind. And 
I'll show you the uh, trick. Like if I get this air cord, this is just air cord, okay? Move these away. Turn the power on. And we'll have a look at uh, the inductance. Well, air cord inductance just sitting in that coil is 11.1 microhenries. You can see that. 11.1 microhenries. That is very low. And if you actually connected that up to the detector, it would look at that as more or less a short circuit. Uh, it won't like it at all. It may damage the detector even. But I think these have current limiting inside, but don't don't find out the hard way. So what we want to do now, we know that's um, very low. Let's have a look at the resistance. And this has resistance at frequency. We want to do it just a standard resistance measurement, 120 hertz. It's getting down. The other measurement's at a kilohertz, which adds um, impedance to it so it, adds, it, it looks at the reactive impedance of the resistance because it's a coil it's not a pure carbon resistor so it will read very very high so if we have a look at that and we've hit the magic number of 0.5 of an ohm so 26 turns of this seven strands of 0 0.2 millimeter wire in a pvc i think it's pvc insulation um yeah comes up at uh, half an ohm that's that's fine for these detectors they like to see that they'll they'll run anywhere between as i've seen on one of the coils it was very low it was about um, 0 0.23 of an ohm um, you know this one here is going to end up at uh, half an ohm and i've seen them up to about 0 0.8 of an ohm and they all still work on these pulse induction detectors now what we'll do We'll just turn this off because I don't know how good the battery is in that. I haven't changed it for quite a while. These cores, okay. I'll just make sure I've got this uh, in frame on the camera. I've got to tilt my head back and have a look. Whatever this is, it looks like it's HAG M278 and permeability 9. 9500 extremely high and you don't have to use a pot core but there is a reason for it and i will go into that a little bit it's better to use a pot core one of these things uh, we we need a air gap in these cores because of the, the way these detectors pulse they don't have a um, a bipolar pulse so there's no reset mechanism to reset the crystal lattice structure in these devices. They're quite interesting if you read up on um, ferrites and see how they're made. There's multiple different types of ferrite. So what I'll do, I'll get this. Now, I'll point this out as well. I've used two layers of that um, tape, of that cloth tape over here just to hold these apart and there's a reason I've done that because if I have the surfaces hard up together um, if it's you know ferrite to ferrite you know if you put it together and it made that sort of a sound there you go I'm not in I'm not in um, like if I that now you got the uh, take there it's um, you know it doesn't make any noise so this I've got two layers just over it only needs to go on these bits here it doesn't need to go in and around I just did that because I just pulled off large pieces so what we do we get this and we've got our 26 or 27 turns of that wire on this bobbin they call these bobbins like a sewing machine type bobbin okay we get this and we Make sure we don't squash the wires because it's got little openings in there for the wires to go through. It's got little windows, see? And it doesn't make much difference if it does that. It still works the same. Um, it actually has a hole through the middle where you can screw it up. Um, I have never actually put a metal nut and bolt through one of these. I've always used plastic. But um, 
thinking about the way it's put it well the way it's made with the uh, thick ferrite there I don't think it'd make any damn difference if you put a uh, a metal one there um, you know I think for memory if you really want to anchor it down tight and squash it together you'd use brass or something but uh, I, I never tried I, I don't know if I haven't tried it I'm not going to say do it uh, okay so we've got this thing together at the moment so it's a nice little enclosed unit let's turn it on and we'll just look at the inductance uh, we're measuring it at a kilohertz which is somewhere where we want to be operating now at the moment you can probably see there I hope I'll move it over a bit okay that's 205.7 whatever uh, microhenries that's way too low we want 300 for these detectors it can be 280 300 320 300 um, seems to be the the norm for all these coil manufacturers uh, I the more winds you get in there or partial windings the more capture of the signal you're going to get right when it, in the receive mode um, but it you know sometimes the difference between 280 and 300 might be three quarters of a winding and just to make things so the start um, and the stop end up on the same place in the coil you know this is this is opposed but if you made a coil and you wanted to run proper lead you'd have this one um, come out next to that one so it's all to do with um, how these are made and some of the coils are actually diameter specific that when you wind the coil um, the start the um, the end winding will come around and meet the start wind here and it'll be 300 microhenries plus or minus you know a few microhenries but that's how we measure it anyway that's not the important bit I'm going to bend this down and hopefully you can still see the meter am I zoomed in yes I am if I do that that might be better watch the meter as I put my finger on here and push it I'm pushing the fluffy stuff together the tape I'm putting pressure on the tape so it's actually reducing its thickness oh look at that I'm putting a bit of pressure on there at the moment it's 303 microhenry 304 as I'm altering pressure on the um, pot core so that's what we want 303 microhenries is beautiful this will work really well now if I push really really hard with like that see the inductance starts going up we're up 335 it'll still work so what I usually do with this I'll just pop these out I'll turn that off just so to get a, um, a bit of clamping on this I'm going to wrap some of my Run it, this uh, cloth tape, um, whatever it is, what's it called? Certo, certoplast. Okay. Well, we're going to squash it together with certoplast. So, this is none of this is critical. This is what I'm doing now. I just get to put it there, make sure it's a bit tight, pull it around, and back onto itself. This stuff is not very sticky, but that, that should hold anyway. I'll just tear it off. Okay. I didn't, uh, I just twisted these together so it fell off, of course. But this is a good way to make a little test coil for yourself. Or a little, a test unit coil. Okay, let's turn it on. Fires up in uh, inductance mode, so we'll see where, where it's ended up. 326, so I've done that a little bit on the tight side doesn't matter it's it's good enough for what we're going to do and that should be you know we pushed it down a bit more and it went up see that's what I mean with pressure 340 probably still work um, at that anyway doesn't make much difference but you know you can probably wobble it a bit and move it around um, around that figure now what we should have let's have a look at um, on the resistance at a kilohertz and we'll have a look at the uh, you know reactive resistance of this and remember we had half an ohm. Well, now we've got closer to seven. 
So that's because it's measuring the resistance um, at one kilohertz. If I put this down to 120 hertz, the resistance will, well, it's actually dropped by a factor of 10, uh, 0.7. But anyway, that's how this thing's meant to work. Um, it does have a few more functions on it. There's no capacitance involved because there's, we can't measure capacitance um, through the wires or anything like that. We can uh, basically just hook it up now and see how it goes. That's very easy. What you're going to need is you're going to need a piece of mono cable. You can go and hack one of your old coils um, for some mono cable. Uh, but I've got a, I've got some mono cable here. This stuff here, and I don't I don't know. Oh, it's got hang on, it's got something written on it. Ah, it's off a coil tech coil. It's an old coil tech cable, mono cable. Yeah, that's not foamed. That insulation there. But it does look like a um, a very low dielectric type insulation. So I'll just take that off the detector. And very easy, this is very easy to do. Very easy indeed. We get this. I'll just make sure everything is looking okay. Um, that, that, this is just going to be a little bit of a, a rough setup. Nothing fantastic. I need my soldering. Soldering, that's it. Um, soldering, soldering, whatever. Metal melter. Get some solder. I'm going to say solder from now on. Because uh, if, if I talk to anyone I know and I start saying soldering, they're going to look at me like I'm a bit weird. Okay. Tin that up. It's funny how we say tin it because uh, solder contains a lot of lead. Well, this one does. This is lead solder. Poison hasn't affected me in all these years, so I suppose you you got to ingest it. And if you do work with solder if, uh, or whatever it's called with uh, lead in it, wash your hands afterwards. That's a trick to it. So you don't um, go and grab food and put lead residue all over your food, then ingest it. That's not a very good idea. So you heat this up. Like I say. That's a big blob of solder, and that's how it came off the coil, whatever coil it was. And I did say I should have these coming out the same side. I'm not worried. This is just for a test. That's hooked up. Now we'll get our little coil, little enclosed coil. Stick that in the detector. I'll get rid of those magnifiers. Turn on the uh, thing, we'll turn on the preamp, we'll see what happens. Sometimes these sing. If you haven't got them tight, they can sing, but we'll see what happens. Oh, singing like a... Okay, even though it's um, making audible noises at the switching frequency of the detector, I'll turn this up, you can probably hear it over that. Yeah, but this thing, there's no shield on this, so you probably could get that. And there you go. You could um, connect up the braid and shield it, but you probably have to paint it with some conductive epoxy. Anyway, let's have a look at this thing. Screwdriver. It's very, very noisy, of course. Now, doesn't like me touching it because it's not—it's not earthed. Most of the um, turn it down a bit. Most of the fields, unlike a normal coil, are enclosed in the structure. There will be leakage, though. 
there will always be a bit of leakage and where the windows are I get a very strong reaction if I put that 0.1 piece of gold I don't know I'll try and um, I'll try and angle this up uh, so you can it's very sensitive because it's got so concentrated that's a 0 0.05 So that's singing like a little bird at the moment and definitely doesn't like me touching it. If you want to make a quiet one, you'd have to do a wrap of wire. You would then, um, this, this is horrible to do because I don't like doing it, but you get some silicon. Yeah. You get to turn that off. It's very high pitched here. It's... Um, Whatever the uh, detector is switching at, and it's making those frequencies also um, dividing by three, dividing by two, making all sorts of harmonics as this is, um, it's trying to rattle the structure as it pulses. But yeah, if you wanted to, you could uh, make this up. You could probably block off some of these windows and fill it up with expanding foam or something like that. But you really want to put um, something like even this cloth tape. Uh, between each winding and just rub silicon in it and then keep winding it so it absorbs that noise. Uh, if you actually turn on your detector, one of, the, one of these things, and you, you know, if you've got really good hearing, you can hear it coming, you can hear that pulse coming from the coil. Um, and if you really want to hear it um, and uh, do funny things to your brain, you can stick your ear on the coil. Uh, there's, there's, um, I saw a show once on uh, people putting um, electromagnetic um, pulse devices on the side of their head, and it was about savants. And what was really interesting is that um, they would put this um, electromagnetic device pulsing at whatever it was doing on the side of someone's head, and they'd have it there for like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and then they would say, um, go draw me a picture. Of something and they draw this picture and it was absolutely like they're an artist but they've had no artistic experience ever and it was just amazing that you get someone beforehand they'd say draw me an elephant and it would just look like completely you know it looked like a sheep or a horse or something with a trunk and then they do this experiment on them and say here go draw me the same thing and it would come out near perfect so um yeah pulsing pulsing currents near your head i don't recommend that at all but uh, it was done in, it was done by one of the universities uh, as a uh, experiment but yeah you can probably find that uh, use a few of those keywords and hunt it on google it probably turn up somewhere so anyway um that is how you make a um, a little tiny um, coil that's not really affected by any stray magnetic fields radio waves or anything else in the area uh, with that also, because it's very, very small, um, you could uh, do some very, very, very low noise experiments because that's small enough to build it into a Faraday cage. And I don't mean a Faraday cage like um, my, my ridiculous attempt here um, with this material. And in there, there's a coil somewhere. I don't know if you can see it. Or was in there I took it out there yeah. but uh, yeah I made a spot to put a coil in there it only um, mitigate some of the electric fields from some radio waves but like again this place is full of 50 Hertz and I can't get rid of uh, any of that uh, low frequency um, magnetic component that's in uh, any type of uh, electrical emission and thus you know it doesn't really make the coils quite you know uh, you know, can use cancel coils and so forth. You can um, build this gadget here as a cancel coil if you have double D cable or two mono cables that you can put together on the plug 
better off using double D. A lot of people don't use their double D coils, the old ones. So there's your double D cable. So you could actually put two windings in there. And I've never done it, but you could. Um, and the other, other way you can do this, and you've got to be careful with the material you select again, because the way these um, um, ferrites operate, they, they are really made for um, you know, um, a waveform that has a plus and minus component to it. It, it needs a reset mechanism um, to, it basically flips its um, atomic structure uh, in its polarization. But there is another, there are other ways of doing this. Now, here, this is a 300 microhenry open, sort of enclosed uh, core. It's ferrite of some description. Um, this will make, the, this does work. It will make the detector turn on, but um, it totally desensitizes the receiver. So you can't use that uh, as a um, means of, of using something like that. The only thing about that is that the amount of noise it generates, it really is noisy. And uh, because I've got uh, the two cores sitting on that cloth tape, it's not the core, it will be um, the windings inside uh, just, just rattling around. There's a way to find out um, if you really want to, you can put this, um, put the um, bobbin in the in the freezer, make it really cold, and very quickly put it back inside its little house, and listen to the noise content. Then heat heat it up to about uh, say, you know, the temperature of. Um, hot water coming out the tap or something like that. I don't want to interchange between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Not enough to burn your hand, but you know, just warm. Heat it up because the PVC will go soft. And then try it again after you've heated it up. Even hit it with, hit it with a um, hairdryer, something like that. And if the noise has diminished, you know it's coming from the windings themselves. They are rattling and if the um, PVC is soft it absorbs a lot of that uh, rattling even though it's very high frequency rattling it still rattles so I found that too when I've um, used to uh, do switch mode power supplies they could sometimes be a bit noisy like or you can hear the um, switching frequency or harmonics of and as it warmed up it went away but uh, yeah, I used to actually have to pull it apart and redo everything and come up with ways of making it quiet. But uh, embedding it in silicon does work. Um, for this, don't ever use silicon on a proper coil. Uh, it will dumb the coil down. Believe me, it will. Uh, there's no need to. You really want air spacing or very low dielectric material between each winding. You don't want to um, fill, you know, I've seen commercial manufacturers do this. They put a winding in and they pour epoxy resin all over it. I just go, I look at it, I go, you know, you've got no idea what you're doing, guys. What are you doing that for? You know, that's, that's their idea of holding the wires together so there's no movement. But you've killed probably a third of the performance of the coil by doing that. Don't do that stuff. If you want to do anything such as um, holding coil wires in place in like and clamp them will not move them use some sort of foaming agent like those um, uh, just that canned stuff that you know you spray out that much and it ends up this big if you can use something with a lot of air in it it will not um, really affect the coil too much so yeah, stay away from, well, you can run Celastic in here because you're not using it to receive as such. It's not meant to be really sensitive. So you can pump it full of Celastic. Don't do it to a normal coil, though. And, uh, yeah, even this this makes so much racket. I don't know if filling it with uh, foam would shut it up. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of things you could do. You could probably even block it all off and fill it up with hot melt glue. Don't know, haven't done it. So I'm suggesting things that sound feasible and logical and similar to what I've done in the past with stuff. But uh, yeah, it's uh, rather noisy. If, if I made a commercial piece of equipment and it has a transformer and it's screaming like that, I'd never get another job. <laughs> but like I say, it's just quick, quick and easy. I mean, actually, what I had this in normal mode. Let's try it in enhanced mode. We'll see what it sounds like. You can probably hear that really easy coming through the... Um... Okay. I just flicked it into enhance. It doesn't really do much, but... Look. See, you can use it as a nice little um, receive coil. Now you're getting an idea how um, how pinpointers are made. If you want to make your own pinpointer, right? I think I went over this once before. Where I tried to find the rods I had, and uh, I can't find them. Now, they're in the garage somewhere buried. The, the, the garage is I can't even walk in there. Everyone's used it as a storeroom, so that's and it's enough room there for you know six cars. So that's um. A, a bit of a sad story. I can't use my garage. Uh, but, uh, yeah, if you get a um, a rod and wind it with the same wire as this wire here, uh, because it's an open-ended structure, it doesn't have any closed magnetics, you're going to have to put a lot more wire on, on the thing. But uh, if you put on maybe, I don't know, 150 turns, 50 turns, uh, it just depends. And measure the inductance. When you get up to about 300, you can, um, you know, take the uh, winding on, put in a bit of, bit of uh, PVC tube and, uh, you know, put some uh, um, car... You have to probably paint the inside of it with carbon and put the uh, braid uh, with, with conductive epoxy onto it. And you've made yourself a really good little pinpointer, high-powered pinpointer. Cortec used to make these. I don't think they make them anymore. And uh, they're just really simple to make. All you need is a mono cable like this. Uh, you know, and also, there's mono cable uh, available. Get it from, you, can, you can put mono cable on um, Alibaba or AliExpress. Um, you know, and there may be links to it because I, I bought uh, links of this stuff um, already plug on the end, pre-cut, ready to roll. It was 1.5 metres long, and it wasn't very expensive. Uh, I can't remember what it was. It was a while ago. But, you know, it, with these um, type of arrangements, I'll just have a look here and see if I can see something else you can make one of these out of. Uh, there's so much stuff here. It's hard to see what's what. Um, okay. Let me have a look, see. I no oh, here. Look at this. This is this is a um, Litzwire transformer that I actually built, and it's using the same material. And these I was making these um, with extremely low noise preamplifiers, and I wasn't using bipolar transistors. I was using JFETs, of all things, I think LS349s or something, and I was using um, very low noise JFETs, and I was then impedance converting them down to, um, this is the impedance transformer, and I was uh, um, dropping the impedance of a few thousand ohms down, I think it was probably 50 ohms or so, 100 ohms, and then I was uh, feeding the audio back up on coaxial cable and uh, yeah I supplied power down the coaxial cable as well and I had some uh, piezo sensors in the bottom and they well yeah we'll, we'll say it was for listening to whales but it might have been for listening to something that was bigger and made of metal um, that you can't see from the surface of the water 
leave it there. You can work it out yourself. But I'm going to show you um, if you want a properly enclosed one, you can use cores like this because it's big and it's easy to wind. But there's a, oh, I'm going to explain about this um, reset mechanism in ferrites. You've got to have a positive going pulse, then a negative going pulse for the, for the internal crystal lattice reset structure. Um, it flips domains, right? If it doesn't, the next pulse will come through and it will saturate a little bit and start getting hot. If you're just using low power, like a metal detector, like one of these things, which are only, you know, what, three watts or something, okay, and whatever it is, it's not much. Um, that'll handle the power. That, that's not going to have a detrimental effect. So you can actually put the wines on this. And, you know, these things, this is, I think, um, 2200 permeability. And you put a few more wines on than that. Uh, to get the uh, resistance right, you might have to use a little bit thicker wire. I don't know if it makes much difference. But you can't adjust this. You just have to actually put the turns on. And a trick of mine, uh, if you, you don't want to cut the wire and then measure it because you go, oh, I haven't got enough or whatever, there's a trick to it, right? And on your inductance meter lead, uh, you stick a pin or a needle on it, right? And when you put the winding on, say you start the winding, and you may have um, wherever it is, say, say you've got a wind, I'll give a quick, quick ex um, explanation because seeing is understanding in a lot of cases. Say, you know, I've got to start winding there and I wound on all these turns and I go, oh, what's the inductance? Well, I put one meter uh, lead on here, okay, and on here, the other lead, stick a pin in here. All this cable here, it's going to, it will ignore it. It's not there. It's not part of the circuit. So you don't have to cut your cable. And if you haven't put enough on, well, then you take your pin out and you keep winding it. You know, so you get an idea. It, it's funny how it works too. You say, well, I've got 150. I've put, um, um, you know, 50 turns on. So I need a... Um, another 50 to get to 300 doesn't work like that. You probably only need another three or four turns because it's not linear. The uh, the ratio goes up very very steeply. So be wary of that. That uh, you know if you put um, 50 turns on this and you say oh you know, it's 150 microhenries, put on another 50, and here it it might be in the thousands of micro henry's by the time you've done another 50 so you gotta be careful it's only a couple of wines extra and you'll get the hang of it just stick a pin in there so you get to the metal with the uh, inductance meter and then you measure it you know where you are um, the easiest way to do it i'll show you is there's something um, better than ferrite well no hang on for this application it's better than ferrite but ferrite is the best material for a lot of applications but I'll show you something here. This, this might um, be interesting to some of you people. <clears throat> Where are we? Oops. That just fell over. I've got a big bag of these here. Oh, do these look familiar? Well, that's a small version of something that uh, is um, handed out with... Uh, a particular detector. These are not ferrite. These are iron, and I think they're um, coated yellow and white. Um, it's a, it's a carbon reduced iron. I think for memory, I haven't looked for about twenty years on the uh, write up on these. What the, what they actually are, um, but they are an iron. I know that. And with iron, the way it's um, when they make these uh, iron toroids, it's, it is a toroid, anything that's made out of a sintered iron, carbon, or whatever else, they put other additives in there to get this um, um, end product plus binders. And because the structure of the um, 
I, it's, I think it's like an iron crystal. I, I really haven't read up too much on it in that regard. But uh, I know you can't saturate it. Or you can, sorry. You can saturate it and burn it up, but you'd have to probably put about 500 watts for it. But these, uh, because they've got an internal air gap structure, like the gap here on this one is acting as an internal, like an um, air gap structure, right? So if that was closed up, it would have massive inductance and there's no reset mechanism for this and it'll get hot. Not with this power level, but, you know, that's the gist of it. You can't go and put um, a kilowatt through it. It'll burn up. This one here, you know, you could put uh, quite a lot of power through these. These don't saturate because of the internal air structure. But the big trouble with using iron is, is that because it's low permeability, you need lots and lots and lots of turns, right? So it's, it's less than using air. But you need lots and lots and lots of turns. These these things here are in the thousands. Um, this core here, I don't know, may, may, maybe it's 60 or something. I don't know. That's um, not much anyway. So different um, types. There's all sorts of different uh, materials. There's, there's um, nickel, manganese types. There's all sorts of uh, different ferrite material. These are basically a powdered iron. Uh, structure and they're just stuck it's sintered ground up and uh, pressed with binders cooked uh -huh. and uh, that's what you end up with you can put a lot of power through that they usually use these in low frequency radio uh, transmitters and things like that and i tend to use them um, rather than use ferrite on signal lines and there's a reason i do that um, but uh, other people don't um yeah that's probably um enough on that stuff that's probably bored everyone to tears again sorry about that but if you do want to make your own gadgets like i say you can make them out of the stick ferrites you know they i think they come from russia i don't know if you can buy them anymore you know i think the way things are over there but they're about that long they're like a big just a big um, antenna ferrite rod and you just um, put on as much wines and you can make them make a really good pinpointer out of it. It's very um, sensitive if you put the coil at the end and, uh, you know, poke it like so at things, it'll scream. Um, same with this, you know, I don't know. You can use that, uh, you know, on a, I don't know, say a miniature conveyor belt or something and something goes under. It's very, very sensitive. It'll pick up, you know, you want to pick up very small flecks of metal. Um, I wouldn't use a closed structure. I'd use something a bit different, but you get the gist of it. Keeps the noise out of the system too. And uh, it basically, um, it just works on the magnetic uh, flux leakage from that. Okay, that's probably enough. I just, you know, I had certain stuff on the bench. and I said, oh, I can make a video about that. You know, people might be interested. So I think I've explained how that uh, is put together. I know I didn't show winding it, but, like I said, it's 26 or 27 turns, not critical. And just the air gap here, as long as there is an air gap, um, that's really not critical. You don't want it, you know, you know, huge, you know, size of a the edge of a coin or something like that. But, you know, a couple of thousand of an inch, you know, one mil, half a mil, something like that. And, you know, you can just adjust it so that uh, you get roughly the right inductance. Then you can go and poke around your detector and see what goes on. And yeah, and all you do is sh uh, shut it up because of that uh, switching noise. Which, um, what is it on these things? I think it's um, somewhere somewhere between 10, 10 and uh, 18 kilohertz or something. But there's, there's different pulse lengths. So it's, it's actually a mixture. And that's where it's probably generating a lot of harmonics because you've got long pulses and short pulses coming together. And they, they'd all mix and vibrate at different uh, things and you get all the harmonics from that. Anyway, that's enough. Catches.